right, it looks like as we're gathering here, I'll, I'll go through and I will introduce my colleagues. It is a pleasure and an honor to work with these individuals on stage on a regular basis. And I was really looking forward to organizing this panel to have this conversation about the role Buffalo Bill plays in our various fields of study here. So allow me to introduce the curators and director of the library. We have Karen McCorder, director, director of the Whitney Museum of Western Art. Did I get it right? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, you're director, yes, we're all directors. <laughs> Ashley, superintendent of <laughs> Cody Firearms Museum. <laughs> Rebecca West, president of the Plains Indian Museum. <laughs> and the one that threw me off, who's really a director, Mary Robinson, the Housel Director of the McCracken Research Library. <laughs> and Chuck. Chuck is Lord of the Draper Museum of Natural History. <laughs> so today has been wonderful because I think it really sets the stage for the conversation we will have today on this panel. The paradox of Buffalo Bill, because as we've seen through the morning sessions, Buffalo Bill symbolizes many different facets of the American West political facets, societal changes that were occurring, political, cultural, you name it. Buffalo Bill has some kind of connotation to those movements in 19th century, 20th century America. As uh, representatives of our differing museums here, we frequently deal with the Buffalo Bill image, the Buffalo Bill name. As Paul noted in his presentation today, a few years ago, when we changed our name from the Buffalo Bill Historical Center to the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, there was some consideration about dropping the term, the name, Buffalo Bill, and coming up with something else. So we're gonna hash that out today. The other thing that's great about this is this is the first time I've gathered this group where I have them in a situation where they have to actually listen to me. <laughs> so. With that being said, um, if it does get a, you'll see I got my hard hat, thanks to Dean, who gave me Bob Dellenbach's hard hat, cowboy hat here, so I'm ready for combat. So, as noted, 2000 or 2017 marks the anniversary of the passing of Buffalo Bill Cody. Right after his death, there were two serious movements to create some kind of memorial to his life and legacy. Of course, there was one led by the residents of Colorado who hoped to erect a statue or a mausoleum, a big museum on Lookout Mountain dedicated to the famous scout. Here in Cody, Wyoming, the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association was formed to create a memorial. The idea was some statue by a famous sculpture that would be located in front of the Irma Hotel. Both communities were excited about the prospects of creating these memorials, and believe it or not, both communities worked to get, oh, Steve is here, so. Hands across the state. Well, <laughs> hands across the state boundary. It's not as glamorous, but it works. But anyway, both communities, Denver and Cody, Wyoming, worked together. In fact, there was an office for the Memorial Association from Denver located in the Irma Hotel, raising funds. So this worked, there was collaboration working together, but World War I intervened when America became involved in the Great War, both efforts faltered. So both efforts were cut back. Louisa said, there's no way we can support this with a war going on. Our funding should go to support our troops overseas. So with the projects faltering, and then after the war, things heated up again. Johnny Baker created his Pahaska Teepee Museum at Lookout Mountain. Here in Cody, there was some talk of creating the, fulfilling, I should say, the Colonel's dream of building a military academy. The idea is that the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association would be a military college, and they would train the Rough Riders of the future. And these cowboys from Wyoming would go over to France, go overseas, and ride all the way on horseback to Berlin. Didn't think about that machine gun problem, but, uh, but anyway. That 
falls by the wayside, of course, in the 1920s, and then Mary Jester Allen steps in. Mary Jester Allen rejuvenated the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association, as Peter noted in his wonderful presentation, was able to secure the Scout statue, the first serious memorial to Buffalo Bill. And then uh, in 1927, they dedicated the Buffalo Bill Museum, which was located in the log cabin across the street where the Cody Visitor Center is now located. It was modeled after the, the TE Ranch. And as Paul noted, it contained a lot, a lot of relics. Mary Jester Allen at the same time created the International Cody Family Association with her cousins. Remember, she was a niece of Buffalo Bill. And they secured a lot of the relics. And uh, yeah, Steve will tell you we stole them, but I, I, uh, we, we secured a lot of the material that now is housed at the galleries here. But Mary Jester Allen had bigger ideas. She wanted to create a pioneer center, one that would memorialize not only her uncle, but other settlers of the American West, would study the frontier process and uh, bring in art. And she even had a natural history display as well. She really, towards the end of her life, she passed away in 1960, but she began to see her dream coming to fruition with the dedication of the Whitney, then the Whitney Gallery of Western Art. It's hard to keep track of all these names. I, who am I again? Okay. So, at the, uh, the ceremony where they laid the cornerstone, Mary Jester Allen wrote a nice letter detailing the history of her efforts with the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association, and she noted the construction, the forthcoming construction of the Whitney and this was the way she concluded her letter. This will be the Whitney Gallery building for the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. It is hoped this center will ultimately embrace many additional buildings in addition to the present Buffalo Bill Museum and the Whitney Gallery. I hope that this center will be developed to include many additional buildings filled with relics and memorabilia connected with the life of Colonel Cody and the relics and art connected with the Northern Plains region of the Rocky Mountains of America. Most sincerely, Mary Jester Allen. And here we are today. What I wanna do now is I'll turn it over to the panelists here. They're going to take five, five minutes, and they're going to just basically give you an overview of their museum, what they do, and maybe just touch upon what it's like working under the Buffalo Bill banner. So we'll start, and actually, I was very strategic. Um, I organized them by the year the museums were brought online here. So, sorry, where's Paul Hutton? I'm sorry I had to break with the alphabetical order routine. <laughs> so we'll start with Karen McCorder. Hello everyone, I'm Karen McCorder. I'm curator of the Whitney Western Art Museum, formerly the Whitney Gallery of Western Art. Um, and as Jeremy mentioned, the Whitney was actually the first um, contemporary structure built on this institution's campus. The museum opened its doors in 1959, and when you stand in the threshold to the Whitney, you're actually standing in what used to be the entrance to the museum. Um, and at that entrance, um, several large trucks pulled up and unloaded fabulous loans that comprised the inaugural exhibition in 1959. But our story actually begins much earlier than that. Um, I won't reiterate our entire history, as Peter did a wonderful job this morning of enlightening us all about um, the story which begins really in the 1920s. But for the benefit of those who were not here this morning, I'll just um, touch a bit on our highlights. So in 1922, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney was approached by a contingent of members from the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association. Whitney was a fabulous sculptress and also philanthropist based in New York City, and she was hired for um, the commission of a monumental tribute to Buffalo Bill. She elected to depict him um, as a young scout, and now that really wonderful sculpture stands sentinel out the northern windows of the Whitney's um, gallery. And it's become truly a symbol of not only this institution, but of this town. Um, our history continues thereafter with another Whitney, her son Cornelius Vanderbilt Whitney, who gave $250,000 in the 1950s to establish a museum in his mother's name. Um, he would match that gift upon the opening of the gallery with another $250,000, 
to purchase some among those original loans to the Whitney Gallery. And many of those original purchases hang on our walls. They are truly the gems of our collection, and they represent the backbone of our collection. Um, the Whitney today displays artworks that range in date from about 1830 to the most contemporary production. It embraces a broad variety of styles um, and of subjects. It is really our mission to display and interpret art um, that depicts, interprets itself, or was inspired by the American West. We really espouse that broader definition, and when you walk the galleries upstairs, you'll see everything from representational um, work created by artist explorers, very traditional, conservative, and um, historical work, to artwork that really broaches um, abstraction and other stylistic trends that are more modern and contemporary. Um, but again, our backbone truly is the 100-year period from about 1830 to 1930, with a geographic focus on the northern Rockies and northern plains. Um, for me, coming here two and a half years ago from the Denver Art Museum, I encountered kind of a steep learning curve on Buffalo Bill Cody. Um, I knew him well, I knew his legacy, but I didn't realize the extent to which um, his life uh, involved the patronage of artists and his self-made image through art. Um, so I quickly dove into the Cody pool and started um, hopefully digesting a lot of this great history and, and I'm proud to um, display at least, let's see, we have about 10 great works of art in the Whitney that um, depict Buffalo Bill Cody and there's also work in the Whitney's collection in every other one of the, um, the divisions. Overall, we have about 100 works of art that depict Buffalo Bill Cody in the collection. Um, it was Lou Friedman, who I think still may be here, who asked me this question about a year into my tenure. He said, how many works of art do you have that depict Cody? And I didn't know the answer. So looking into it, I learned that we do have about 100 depictions of Buffalo Bill. We also have a fabulous collection of work that he commissioned. Um, many of the artists Peter mentioned earlier, Stovey and Shrivogel um, among them. And beyond those 100 works in our collection, which are painting, sculpture, prints, there are incredible um, collections of posters and of his depiction in multiple media, of photographs as well. Um, so we're really able to tell his story and really in, enliven and um, illuminate it through artwork. And for me, um, what it boils down to, my interest in Cody is really the way in which he harnessed his own image um, for promotional purposes and to promote his ideals um, and, and those that he admired in the West. Through posters and fine art, um, through their display and interpretation, we can help show how he shared that story with the world. Thank you. Ashley. Hi, I'm Ashley Levinsky. I'm the Robert W. Woodruff Curator of the Cody Firearms Museum. And our institution got its start in the 70s. And it was thanks to Winchester. So we'll go from Cody to Winchester uh, and the quintessential gun that won the West. And that was uh, in the 1860s, Oliver Winchester decided to start a firearms collection. He started with uh, precursors to the Winchester and he quickly expanded it out to competitors models, their prototypes, historic firearms, you name it. They had pretty much everything that related to guns. And in the 1960s, Winchester had gone through several different changes. Uh, they went bankrupt in the 1930s, were bought out by uh, the Olin Industries, uh, who still owns the name today. And by the 1960s, the New Haven plant, where they housed about 4,000 firearms and thousands of design drawings, records, ephemera, Winchester ammunition, was all in New Haven, Connecticut. And in the late 60s, early 70s, it wasn't the safest place to have the collection. They really didn't have the space to honor such a historic collection of firearms. And so they started looking for a new home. And they looked at two places, Disneyland in Anaheim, California, and Cody, Wyoming. <laughs> we think they made the right choice. <laughs> and so in November of 1975, they started the paperwork for a permanent loan of the firearms collection, almost the entire collection, uh, with some exceptions. And on July 4th, 1976, in perfect Western fashion, John Wayne was here to help dedicate the Winchester Arms Collection to the, to, the fi or to the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. We opened the museum in the early 1980s as the Winchester Arms Museum, and that was actually underneath where the Buffalo Bill Museum is now. And uh, in 1988, they gifted the collection to us. So it was on loan 
then they gave it to us. And we started building another wing. We decided we needed more real estate because the collection had grown. And we had had Remington's collection and several other firearms manufacturers collections, including a man named Bill Ruger. And if you're a firearms person, you probably recognize that name. Well, William B. Ruger was on our board, and as I understand it, and I feel like Al Simpson was in the room here, uh, in a board meeting, Bill Ruger finally got fed up, and he threw his hands up, and he said, I'll give you a million dollars if you change the name of the museum to anything other than a firearms manufacturer. Because the reality behind that was that the Winchester collection itself was encyclopedic. It wasn't just Winchester. And by that time, we were really starting to develop a, a collection that was not just Winchester, it was Smith and Wessons and Colts and Rugers and you name it, I could go on forever. And so uh, it did not take much uh, arguing for them to agree to change the name for that million dollars. He wrote a million dollar check on the spot. And in 1991, we opened as the Cody Firearms Museum. Now we have about 7,000 firearms today in the collection, and that collection starts all the way back um, in the 1200s with some of our crossbows. Yes, we've got crossbows um, that were Winchester collection. And it goes all the way up through, I think our most recent acquisition was made in 2016. We're a little bit different than some of the other museums at the center because we're not just the American West. We have an international collections of, collection of firearms, but we, we kind of expand our definition of what the American West is and what the West is because Winchester saw value in collecting firearms from all over the world because it helped inform his industry. And so our collection today, uh, I pretty much, I, can't, I don't think I can name a manufacturer that we're missing. Um, and we really embrace the fact that we have that encyclopedic nature of our collection. We display about 4,000 of our 7,000 firearms on display. And uh, interestingly enough, all of the Buffalo Bill firearms are in the Buffalo Bill Museum. We do have one Annie Oakley gun. But what I think is an interesting connection for us with Buffalo Bill, and I like Karen had a quick learning curve as I studied the perception of firearms in culture and was much more of a modern historian when I came here is really the, the target shooting and the exhibition shooting and the, the, the famous characters that we associate with firearms. I mean, he really started that entire Western genre. And although I don't know if he would have liked to have <laughs> called it that, but uh, he started that entire genre. And you can see in our museum how people have evolved with that and how they developed different types of exhibition shooting and competition shooting over the years. So it really does lay the foundation for that. Even though we don't have Cody's guns per se in our museum, um, it, it's, it's the heartbeat uh, of the collection. It's the Cody collection. And right now, our museum is about to undergo a major renovation. So we are staying in the same footprint, but we are completely redoing the galleries. We're doing uh, a bigger emphasis to the general public. We uh, have our gun enthusiast audience, and we love them. But we're also trying to do more with hands-on interactives to contextualize firearms so that people, when they come in, they really understand why there's a firearms museum at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, and also why firearms are important to our history. So we're working on that right now. We're gonna display more guns, believe it or not. Uh, and we're gonna have a lot more for people to get hands on with our history and learn about firearms. And uh, that hopefully will open in the summer of 2019. So it's kind of an exciting time. Rebecca? Okay, hi everyone, I'm Rebecca West and I'm the curator of Plains Indian Cultures and the Plains Indian Museum here. And the Plains Indian Museum officially started, as you see the wing now, in 1976. However, it should be noted that there were Plains Indian collections down in the basement uh, where you see the Cody to the World and the Centennial exhibit right now. And there's a wonderful black and white image if you go in the Centennial exhibit of Dr. Harold McCracken standing amongst the curio style cabinetry and objects that were the original Plains Indian Museum. And on November 3rd, 1976, and believe it or not, we do have the original minutes from this very meeting that was uh, organized by then brand new director, Peter Hasrick, who is with us today in the audience. Uh, it was decided that it was time to take those items out of the basement and out of that traditional curio style presentation and do something that was really earth shattering for 1976. And you have to remember that 1976 was on the heels of the American Indian Movement and they had occupied Alcatraz um, for a number of years. And there was a, a great fear um, of the power of the Native Movement. And in fact, there's a, a bit of ugly history in the 
the center's history where Dr. Harold McCracken actually had the National Guard on call to ensure that uh, some of the Indian members of AIM or who else, I'm not sure who he's afraid of, would come into the museum and take over and perhaps take some of the artifacts. Of course, that never materialized and we turned the page on to a much more positive chapter of the Plains Indian Museum history. And this was a big moment because the advisory board was formed in 1976 and this was, if not the first, one of the first museums in the nation and perhaps the world to actually include native people uh, in its roster for an Indian museum. And I'd like to note that we actually uh, have one of the founding members, Arthur Amiot, with us here today and he's going to be our keynote speaker tomorrow. Arthur was actually a founding member in 1976 as, and was integral to this very groundbreaking concept uh, of a museum. And when it did open in 1979, uh, it was about 25,000 square feet of exhibit space. And it was a very nice change from the traditional chronological or from maybe the, the views of historians. It had a native voice to it and it was an accurate representation of native cultures. Now, in addition to opening up this new museum, the advisors also uh, formulated a great mission statement. And they also came up with a policy for culturally sensitive and sacred materials. And this was unheard of in the 1970s, and we still look to that today. And beyond that, um, we move on to the year 2000 when we did a complete reinstallation and again, we had two founding members, Lloyd Kivanu, who has since passed, and also Arthur Amiot, of course, who contributed greatly to that reinstallation. And that is what you see here today. And now, more than ever, we're very much aware of not just the need to share these collections, but the relationships that we have founded over the years that started back in 1976. Uh, because what we're dealing with here is with the mission statement, and this is a key part of what we do every single day, is that we are sharing living American Indian cultures, their histories, their arts. And also, there's a belief, and this is quoting the mission statement, that the past is best used when it serves the present and the future. And it's something that's very important. We're not just looking into the past. Yes, we do have 10,000 uh, objects that date primarily from about 1860 to the 1930s, but it's essential that we use these objects to examine the relevance of these collections to today's native cultures, but also all audiences. So that's where we are right now, and of course we do have to remember, as we're in the centennial year, that technically none of these museums would have been here if we hadn't had William F. Cody, okay? The Buffalo Bill Memorial Association was founded for his memory, and we've grown since then. We've taken a path that's very different than some of the other museums, and I think we all will probably state that. But we embrace our diversity, and we also uh, very much appreciate the work that's been done in the past by our elders and others to pave the way to a wonderful future. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm Mary Robinson, Housel Director of the McCracken Research Library. The fact that I know just about every other person <laughs> seated in this room as a researcher will tell you already something <laughs> about how well used our archives are. Um, we are a full service research library now, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, and we have a, a very charming little photograph that I keep in my office of the co-reading room that was in the Buffalo Bill Museum. Um, it's, it shows a, a comfortable table and nice furniture and it shows photographs on the walls but also books and documents which tells you that we were a special collections library from the beginning and we remain so today. Um, but as the center evolved so did our facility and um, in the 1970s, when we had curators who were building resources and trying to house them in their various curatorial offices, it was decided that we needed to consolidate. And so those resources became the founding collections of the McCracken. 
and that library was dedicated in 1980 and named for Harold McCracken, who was the first director of the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. The library was then located in a space that's just outside the Co. Auditorium where you are now. It's it where it is where our PR office is. That was the original McCracken Research Library space. Um, and uh, as things developed in the 1990s, uh, the library was relocated and expanded, and and um, we are in the same in the location where we are today. And um, so we had then a a gallery, um, a, re a reception room and much more vault space. Um, and then in, the, um, in, in about 2000, when the Draper was installed, we acquired another large vault, which we have readily filled with stuff. Um, and then finally in 2007, under Kurt Graham, we remodeled our reading room and gallery, and uh, you see our facility as it is today. If you don't know, we're located down the hall in the uh, below the Buffalo Bill Museum Wing. The library collections represent the disciplines of this museum. So we have resources and rarities related to the history of the American West, Western art and artists, Plains Indian cultures, American firearms, and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. But the largest and most used collection by far is the William F. Cody and Buffalo Bill Wild West collections. Um, we are, uh, a staff that's constantly interacting with people and scholars, um, and particularly with interest in the photographs of that collection, which I'll talk about later. Um, as we've evolved, digitization of our resources has become much more important, and we've been successful in getting grants to digitize uh, a great deal of our material. And we're now involved with regional cooperatives that put our resources in national portals uh, based in Utah and in Boston, Massachusetts. As it's stated on our website, the, wi the McCracken Research Library advances the understanding, appreciation, and study of the American West and plays an integral role in the creation and dissemination of scholarship on the region. Thanks, Mary, and good afternoon. <coughs> I'm uh, Charles Chuck Preston. I'm the Willis McDonald IV Senior Curator of Natural Science and the founding curator in charge of the Draper Natural History Museum. And in, in many ways, I'm an outlier in this group and in the center in some respects. But, but as I think it through, I think uh, the natural history presence here is at one time and one way uh, more apart and outlying from the Buffalo Bill legacy, and in other ways, absolutely the most in line with the legend and the myth and the reality of, of Buffalo Bill and what inspired him to come west and live west. Um, I love I love the word paradox. We've used it. I, I listened to Patty Limerick's talk today, and and Jeremy's used the term a lot. And I'm, I'm always when I hear the word paradox, I'm always reminded of my favorite paradox quote from that that notable scholar Yogi Berra. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he said, nobody ever comes here anymore. It's too crowded. <laughs> um, and I, I do want to talk about some of the paradoxes later, but uh, let me give you a little, little insight into the, the uh, history of the, the Draper Natural History Museum. And, it, and because I'm the founding curator, it necessarily sort of starts with me in some respects. Although this had been discussed, the idea of adding a science entity and a natural history entity to Buffalo Bill at that time Historical Center had been discussed for at least 10 years. Peter can give you all of the, um, the background on that. I've read, Peter, I've, those minutes, even the ones that were hidden away, <laughs> I've read them all and they're wonderful. They're, and my book will come out soon <laughs> as I retire uh, on that because it was a challenge. I mean, you think about it, a real challenge for a lot of people especially. Uh, in my mind, it made perfect sense, but, but a real challenge for folks who had been long-term supporters and patrons of this humanities-based institution to, first of all, the word scum was used earlier today, <laughs> to bring a scientist into this <laughs> humanities-based institution and to bring science in. Well, I had, uh, uh, and so this discussion got on for about 10 years, thanks to primarily uh, Nancy Carol Draper um, and when she came on the, the board of the center. A lot of controversy. I think controversy stirs up a lot of good things and some bad, but I, but I think it's, it's healthy. And so I 
not knowing any of this, uh, was at the Denver Museum of Natural, well, then was the D Denver Museum of Natural History at the time, and it was uh, also a, uh, a professor and an affiliation both with Denver University and University of Colorado Boulder, um, working as a, as a pretty traditionally trained ecologist and, and natural scientist. But I had been writing for the last couple of years and lecturing across the country on, because this is the mid-90s and you can get away with that, on the, the role and the potential for natural history museums in the 21st century. Um, somebody had seen a talk I gave at, at the Smithsonian or American Museum of Natural History at that time. It was traveling a lot. And they called me when, when it was decided, when the board finally decided in 1990, I think late 1997, um, to consider establishing and really decide to, to establish a natural history museum here at the center. Uh, and uh, when I first heard it, and this is, this is part of what I want to talk about the legacy of Buffalo Bill later, but I'll just skim on it now. Um, the, first, uh, the first response I had in my head, and I love Cody, I'd been through Cody many times and I'd, I'd done some research and, and led many groups through Yellowstone over the years. Uh, and when they said, well, this Buffalo Bill Historical Center in Cody, Wyoming wants to add a natural history museum. We'd love for you to come up and talk to us about it. We've read some of what you've written. Uh, one of our trustees saw you speak and, and we'd love for you to, to come and have that discussion. I said, Buffalo Bill Historical Center? I don't know. That does, no, and I, I said no and I got about two or three other calls and finally I said, you know, these people sound pretty serious about this. I came up, walked in the door and was blown away. I said, my gosh, this is so much of what I had written about in terms of, of natural history museums integrating more humanities disciplines and the human aspect into natural science and environment. Uh, and so I, I came up in, in uh, 1998. Uh, we spent four years. Uh, I had an opportunity of 10 lifetimes to help design, lead the design and development of the Draper Natural History Museum. We decided, because I'm primarily an ecologist, not a systematic zoologist with birds and mammals over here and the Hall of Man over here or something. Um, I, I'm an ecologist, so I took an ecolo ecological approach and we designed it, uh, as you see, from Alpine um, spiraling down into the Plains Basin, really to cover the biomes of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and to integrate in that the wildlife, of course, geology and landscapes, but also the human presence as much as we could, drawing from all of the, the other museums here, which is an incredible opportunity in itself and one of the things that really attracted me here. Um, so we opened 15 years ago this year, in two, uh, June of 2002, with Richard Leakey, uh, who uh, spoke uh, at our grand opening, and also Clint Eastwood, who dropped by for a while. <laughs> so we had a, quite a day uh, in talk about Paradox, huh? <laughs> um, and, and it was, uh, uh, we've, we've uh, uh, moved on, uh, we've expanded um, our programming, our research, uh, everything over these last few years has gone in some ways far more slowly than I would have thought, but really more quickly than could have been expected, I think. Our, our mission, I mean, in, in, in the simple terms, is to really to excite minds of all ages um, with a curiosity and, and about both the product and the process, which is a human process, process of science, uh, and uh, to increase the understanding and appreciation of the relationships binding people and nature. So it's a science museum and we're, we're pretty hardcore science because that's what I'm trained in, but at the same time we incorporate the humanities. We incorporate maybe like, like William F. Cody may have done and did to some extent, incorporate nature uh, and people um, in, in this, this amalgam we call the American West. It's funny that, that um, the West, we had a, a Naomi Tate hosted us, many of us, curators here at the time. I think I'm about the oldest one now here, <laughs> come to think of it. That's why I'm senior curator. Um, but we, there was a round table, must have been 30 people around the table, and, and they said, so what does the West mean to you? Because we were really talking about marketing and other things, and, and every person there talked about human quality. Oh, well, the West is hardworking individuals and individualism and, and self-reliance and and integrity and all that. And, I, and when it came to me, I, I just had to burst everyone's bubble, I guess, or maybe not. They ignored me, I'm sure. But I said, you know, I come from the South. And if I asked people what the South meant to them, 
they would come up with those same words. And so to me, what's unique about the West is I think something that, that was triggered in, in William F. Cody so long ago. It's the West. It's the West, it's the landscapes, it's the wildlife, and it's the people, the indigenous people that were here. It is, and I'm using this euphemistically now, but it is the frontier of the mind. I think that's what's exciting. That's what the opportunity, I think, is for a scientist to be here in this kind of an institution with the legacy of, uh, uh, of Buffalo Bill and, and, and others. All right, thank you. So. So I have a few questions that I'm going to pose. I'm going to try and stump the panelists here. And then we'll turn it over to, to public questions. But anyway, our day-to-day -day tasks here at the center, I think each and every one of us would say the majority of our time is interacting with the visitors in some form or fashion. That could be through our exhibits, inquiries, visitors coming into our office asking questions, and programming. Programming, so interpreting our varying fields of study to our visitors, to the public that enters the front door here. As noted in uh, Patty's Limerick, there's a lot of paradoxes with Buffalo Bill. To some people, he's a great hero. He's the one that rides in and saves the day. His Wild West glamorized things like the Pony Express, the, the romance, the adventure, the hard work of the pioneers that came out into the American West to settle. But the other side there is the, the darker side. So a lot of people, thanks in part to Paul Newman's 1976 movie, view him as the guy who wiped out all of the bison, killed off all of the Plains Indians. So we have this interesting paradox with Buffalo Bill, varying viewpoints held by our publics as they come in through the front door here. So to the panelist, how does working at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, your day-to-day -day interaction with the public, how do you feel that's influenced by this legacy of Buffalo Bill? Anybody mind if I start with that? Because it's yes, I do, kick Chuck. me out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> After I finish. Well, uh, let me relate one little story. When I, um, I was at the Denver Museum of Natural History for about eight years. Before that, I'd, I just had resigned uh, academic tenure before that to come to the Denver Museum when they recruited me to head up the zoology department. And then I was director, although I like Lord better now. Uh, of the uh, conservation biology group with uh, uh, CU Boulder and, and DU and, and actually CU um, Denver uh, and, uh, and of course the Denver Museum in my zoology department. Um, so, and I had just gotten a big, I'd been at Denver about eight years and I, I'd been telling people, I'm, boy, I, was, I was just feeling restless. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, at that time in my life, I was what, 40, mid 40s feeling pretty restless at that time, and, and uh, I'd mentioned that to folks, I'd say, boy, nothing's wrong, I just got this big National Science Foundation grant and a few other things, but, um, but I'm kind of looking around. So when this call came and I, I found this place and they were nice enough to, to give me a shot at creating what became the first major natural history museum in, in America uh, in, the 20, in and for the 21st century. So great opportunity, but when I told my colleagues, both at CU and, and at the Denver Museum, I said, Guys, I'm, I'm resigning. I'm going to accept this position at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. There was dead silence usually, no matter who I talked to. And these are all scientists. And, and they said, Chuck, it, is it really that bad? Is it, are you going to a carnival? They thought when, when it, it wasn't the negative aspect, and that's what a lot of people think, that, well, gee, Buffalo Bill killed all these buffalo, so boy, these, these in, environmental scientists are or conservation biologists have a, have a problem with Buffalo Bill. Not that at all. Scientists in general, I don't think any, it, my colleagues don't look at, at that problem with Buffalo Bill. It, that's revisionist history to go back and do that. So, so that's not the issue. The issue is the name itself and all the connotations over the last hundred years of Buffalo Bill and the Paul Newman movie and others. And the term Buffalo Bill, um, forget Silence of the Lambs for a minute, <laughs> is still, it has sort of a carnival-like connotation, just the term. So there is, there is a negative, and I'll, I'll be glad in a minute when everybody else speaks to talk about some real positives about this, but, but the negative part of the legacy is that immediately when my colleagues in the scientific community and a lot of the public that follows natural science and conservation, when they hear Buffalo Bill, it's not 
that they, they have an aversion to him because he killed buffalo uh, or bison, which we, we prefer. But um, but it is this sort of um, it, it seems very superficial to a lot of people. It seems what's that got to do with science? What is something called Buffalo Bill? Even now that it's center of the West and not historical center, what's that got to do with science? So that's been something we've had to overcome. Unfortunately, I was pretty mid to late career when I came here, so um, we had a little bit of a reputation, and, and people, you know, it wasn't like it was just starting out coming from from something called the Buffalo Bill Historical Center at that time. So that was a challenge, and it continues to be a challenge, because when you hear Buffalo Bill, you think in Buffalo Bill Center of the West, to my colleagues, that sounds like a humanities place, no room for science in there. So in a sense, the Draper Natural History Museum, although we've, we've gained a lot of credibility in the scientific community, in general, for visitors coming through Yellowstone, they certainly are surprised to see a natural science museum here in our natural history museum about Yellowstone in a place called Buffalo Bill Center of the West. It's a challenge, but it also there's some great advantages that I'll hopefully have a chance to talk about. Thank you. Mary. I'll just add to that. I think uh, Europeans uh, know the name of Buffalo Bill. They also are familiar with Yellowstone. But they don't connect the two in a physical space. This is, that is, seems to be a, a reach for people or, or, or a new idea. Um, for me, I, I'm a collections manager. I'm, I'm the gatekeeper of the McCracken archives. It's my job to acquire primary sources and to evaluate incoming gifts, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, this is a job that I'm doing on a daily basis. Um, and uh, over the 15 years, and it's been 15 since I took this job, I've, I've, I've gone up a learning curve, and I've learned to, to get an eye for the, for the good material. Uh, and I've come to, um, to appreciate the, the legacy um, and the richness of material that's out there in the world. And um, what this has done then has led to my ability to speak to granting agencies about the legacy and to convince them to fund us. And that has been my, um, my opening into this subject matter. And um, because on a daily basis, I see scholars using this material, I answer questions and work with the public, um, I'm more and more impressed with the, the applicability, the vitality of the, of the research materials that we have. And they continue to grow, and that's my job, is to, to make them grow. So yes, we overcome a certain skepticism. Many of our uh, funding agencies are on the, on the coasts, and uh, Buffalo Bill is, is not necessarily at the top of their list. But um, the, the fact that, that, um, that I'm in a front row seat and can talk to them about the uses of these materials has made a difference. The other thing, of course, is that we've developed scholarship ourselves and the papers of William F. Cody, which was a, a library initiative in its early years, um, has been hosting, sponsoring scholarship and raising that uh, awareness. So um, it wasn't very difficult about four years ago when we embarked on a grant writing project to IMLS and um, we got our grant to digitize the Cody photographs. And that photographic legacy is part of what um, I oversee here at the museum. We, we have the historic photographs, and uh, it's a massive collection. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, historic um, um, uh, do documentary collection of 19th century America and uh, early 20th century America. Uh, its uses are vast and varied for all kinds of projects. So again, I can attest to that, um, and that's um, been part of what I do here. Uh, with Jeremy's help, I compiled information on the, um, the monies that have come into this museum since I was here and began here in 2001, and it's over $2 million has come through our door um, dedicated to Cody scholarship, the digitization of our collections, and the, the outreach that we, we, um, we offer. So um, uh, collections management is an interesting challenge. Donors, the relationship with donors can be rather fraught. We have prima donna collectors. We have dumpster divers. And I, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at some negatives that were found in a dumpster in Texas. <laughs> but they happen to be from the Indian Wars 
film project. So uh, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't have a Buffalo Bill related item on my desk for consideration. Hmm. Rebecca. Well, it's interesting, our day-to-day -day realities are surprisingly not different, but one of mine is the fact that it's a privilege that I am able to work with all of the objects that we have, and we're not just in charge of the physical care of these items. These are items that truly have a life and a history to them. We try to remember that and also be cognizant that we are in charge of their spiritual well-being. Uh, we're in charge of researching and sharing all of their histories and some things come in with very little information and our challenges and other items have a wealth of information and a, a true life and history of their own uh, but it's interesting because when we're working especially with native communities that come to the center here the largest challenge is not actually the buffalo bill name it's the fact that we are a museum because museums do not have a good reputation with native cultures. Uh, native cultures uh, often had uh, human remains and other items that were kept in museums that were not actually treated with respect. Um, they still are considered a very intimidating place for people to come and visit. So that's one of our greatest challenges on a day-to-day -day basis is to make sure that all audiences, but especially native cultures, feel welcome here and know that they can come visit items. Um, and there's another interesting observation that I'm thinking about as we're all talking, um, which is the fact that the Buffalo Bill Wild West Show did have a role in creating, through popular culture, the stereotypical images of Native Americans. Now, many of those have continued today, uh, but we can't just pin this on Buffalo Bill. This is centuries of popular culture stemming from the Wild West shows, but of course there were dime novels. There were shows that came after Buffalo Bill. And I also thought, as Jeremy had posed these questions earlier, that it's all of our responsibilities to responsibly process all of this information and not necessarily just rely on popular culture. That's a pretty tough thing to do these days with the wealth of social media and everything else. And it's interesting that old time popular culture really did make Buffalo Bill, but when we look at what's going on today with all the different directions of social media and such, it also does have the potential to wipe out the image of Buffalo Bill or perhaps to critically and honestly assess. And I guess that's what we're all here doing in the next couple days, so glad to be a part of it. Thank you, Ashley. So kind of like Rebecca said, for us, it's not so much about Buffalo Bill, but there's a couple of different things that we that are positives and negatives with the Firearms Museum. Um, but the first is really the connection to, to the American West and the Winchester connection to the museum. And I mentioned when we first were talking that we're not a Western museum. And we have collections from, you know, all of firearms history. And so one of the things that we struggle with, especially with the name Buffalo Bill Center of the West, is where do we fall in and how do we allow people to know that our collection is, is broader than that? Uh, I know that we had a conversation years and years ago when I first started. Um, you know, are we a Western museum? Do we want to be a Western firearms museum? And if we want to be that, you know, does that mean we have to change what collections we have, what our collecting strategy is? And I think today we very much embrace the fact that we do have this large, vast collection. So for us, it's first and foremost making the connection that, yes, we have our legacy in the Winchester collection and, and with the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, but our collection goes beyond that and how we can tie Buffalo Bill and the rest of the world with the firearms collection that we have that's international. And so it's kind of that Western connection for us the other thing is uh, scale. I always find that when I'm trying, I come from the East Coast, East Coast Yankee, and uh, when I was at the Smithsonian, 
I remember coming out here and we were talking about a loan of the firearms and it was really hard for me to explain to people just how large and vast this institution was. And that was back when it was the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. Um, and so scale has been another thing. I can talk till I'm blue in the face about how large and how impactful this organization is, but really a lot of people need to come here to see it, to feel that impact because they associate it with you know, Buffalo Bill or the American West and some coastal people where they just don't necessarily feel that that's relevant and it's incredibly relevant today. Although I have to say if it was the Annie Oakley Museum, I bet you people from my world would <laughs> know what that was right away. Um, and then the other thing for that is that there's kind of the, the, the big negative for me is the, and Jeremy and I have talked about this and we're trying to kind of figure it out. In the new museum, we are going to have a designated section on the story of the American West. It'll be, you know, a recreation of a Western town. It will talk about the various ways firearms were used, the fact that Winchesters weren't the only gun uh, in the American West. Uh, and we will bring in pop culture and, you know, Buffalo Bill's Wild West and the evolution of the Western and today's cowboy action shooting into that museum. So there is a Western presence that's stronger in our museum than there was before. But the the kind of issue that we run into is that when people come into the firearms museum, they stop us all the time and they go, okay, so where's Buffalo Bill's guns? And I'm like, all right, sir, you have to uh, go up the <laughs> elevator and leave the museum and walk across the hallway to the Buffalo Bill Museum. And how, it, how we can tie that connection to Buffalo Bill and the Buffalo Bill firearms and artifacts into our museums, because we are the Cody <laughs> Firearms Museum. And so that's one thing that I don't know if we've figured out the solution, but we're trying to in the new museum is how can we move that Western story into our museum while still, you know, in incorporating the large network that we have in, in our collection. Thank you. Karen. I think as with Mary, uh, Buffalo Bill bubbles up in my daily work here at the center. Um, if not daily, then certainly weekly. Um, we entertain offers of gifts and inquiries about artwork related to Buffalo Bill fairly frequently. So again, um, I'm ha I am always happy to answer those questions, and it generally involves a wonderful adventure and research on my behalf, so I welcome those. Also, as I give tours of the Whitney, um, we have a prominent area within the gallery dedicated to Buffalo Bill, and what I love about it is it depicts, um, or rather represents art depicting Buffalo Bill from the most historical um, to the most contemporary, and each of those representations, you know, um, helps us illuminate the fact that Buffalo Bill is an incredibly complex figure. They all serve as con uh, conversation starters, and, and I certainly hope to um, you know, continue to embrace and um, really invigorate those kind of conversations in, in my gallery. And, and I am also steward to a collection, as I mentioned, that is well beyond the walls of the Whitney. Um, we have many works of art, objects of sculpture and paintings in the Buffalo Bill Museum. So I work alongside Jeremy to curate that space as well, generally with work that Buffalo Bill commissioned that can help enliven his early story, um, but also work that helps illuminate Western American history um, you know, uh, related in a way to Buffalo Bill. So it's, it really is a, you know, a pleasure to work under the banner of Buffalo Bill. And the Whitney was the f really the first um, and the finest museum of Western American art. And we maintain that reputation in our um, our connection to Buffalo Bill really through the scout and that early history um, is something that we wear as a badge of honor. Thank you. So um, the other side of our responsibilities here, we're being pushed more and more to produce scholarship. And all of you represent very different academic fields. You're members of very different academic professions, uh, professional societies, associations. So in that regard, how do you feel working with the Buffalo Bill Banner has impacted your own research and your interactions with colleagues within your field. And then um, we're running a little short on time, but I, if you would, may touch upon some of the interdisciplinary opportunities that we have produced as a curatorial team. So we'll start with you, Karen. Sure, I'll just take as an example an exhibition that we're currently working on. Um, actually, three of the content creators are here, Emily Burns, Peter Hastrick, and myself. All are contributing to an exhibition uh, looking at Albert Bierstadt as a history painter rather than just as a Grand Manor landscape painter. Um, the centerpiece to that exhibition is Bierstadt's The Last of the Buffalo, but a prominent um, part of the story that we're telling is Bierstadt's experience in Paris at the Exposition Universelle and um, the fact that Buffalo Bill's Lakota performers visited Bierstadt's Last of the Buffalo painting, the conversations that it started when it was on view 
in Paris. I think being here specifically at the center um, allows us to tell that story best. And I know that Emily and Peter um, and I as well have really benefited from proximity to the McCracken Research Library and using those incredible res research resources. Um, so it, it, it's currently very much on our minds. Um, in terms of interdisciplinarity, I think we really uh, have wonderful opportunities here and more so certainly than other institutions, most other institutions, we have the chance to look at Buffalo Bill and his history um, and that of the American West in general through a, you know, a multifocal lens. Um, and, and I certainly appreciate that. And I, uh, my first opportunity at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West six years ago was actually working for Jeremy as a fellow, a Buffalo Bill resident fellow. And what I studied, which I never thought I would in a million years because I was studying perception, but I looked at the comparisons uh, of the Buffalo Bill's Wild West and the evolution of Western film and television and compared it to classical theater. I didn't think I would make the connection to, but we were looking at the way that firearms are glamorized and demonized in, you know, historically in society and then in today's society. And so my research really is informed by the, the showmanship of Buffalo Bill, Annie Oakley, Lillian Smith, and all of those exhibition shooters, because as I said earlier, it really is a lineage that continues up till today. Um, the other thing I'd like to touch on more the interdisciplinary nature because I think this is a wonderful opportunity, especially with a firearms museum because we're an object driven museum. Uh, like, like an art museum, and a lot of times when you see exhibitions, you don't necessarily see firearms with them when they're history themed um, or geared towards a specific theme or subject. And with this opportunity, our collection is so broad and so vast that we can have some kind of relationship with every single museum in here. And so having the Firearms Museum here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, I think is, is a great opportunity for us to figure out new ways that we can include guns as art and in art and how we can talk about it in Plains Indian culture and, and in natural history with conservation. And so we've really made a, a huge stand in the new museum to incorporate all of these curators in each of the sections when relevant to see how we can interpret the story better so that we have a better tie to the Buffalo Bill Center of the West and are kind of just this gun museum, you know, off to the side that doesn't really feel like it connects. And so I think we have a really unique opportunity to do that. The m a lot of museums and collections around the country don't have such a great opportunity to try and find a way to look differently about how firearms are used or and look at all the different ways firearms are used because we tend to focus on more of the negative in today's society. And so being a part of a bigger organization gives us that opportunity to tell those various narratives um, and work with some pretty awesome people. And speaking of awesome people, this is a really exciting time for the six of us. And we discuss this a lot. Um, and I feel like scholarship has a life of its own regardless of the name of the institution. It's really the resources you have, the drive you have, and the people you work with that can make things happen. So I don't feel that uh, the name has affected anything at all. I think we've all managed to come out with wonderful publications, exhibitions, and other programs that are unique to our areas, but also speak to the center name. Um, and we're doing some new things. I mean, obviously we all have collection items that are, we have firearms and, and contemporary art and Buffalo Bill museums. And uh, Chuck Preston and I, he was kind enough to invite me to collaborate with him on his upcoming Monarchs of the Skies, which will have a Plains Indian Museum component. And I guess I, I see this as an opportunity not just to put things in different galleries, to spread things out, um, but what Ashley alluded to is the fact that we all have a common goal here. We're trying to share, we're trying to educate, we're trying to learn more every day. And we have a wealth of resources here. So it's never a dull moment here because we have so many fantastic opportunities and fantastic objects that we get to work with every day. Um, and I don't really look towards names and different divisions um, as something that impedes us. I think it's all a great opportunity. So maybe I'm the, op the uh, optimist of the group. Uh, but I think that this group, especially right now, uh, we're right on the cusp of something great because we're all realizing that it's not just about us as individuals or individual museums. It's about serving the needs of people who want to be involved with us. That's a great emphasis, Rebecca. Uh, of course, uh, 
as a librarian, we're I'm involved in service. Uh, but uh, I also have the privilege of delving into collections that run across the disciplines in this museum. So uh, I'm not a scholar of Buffalo Bill. I don't pretend to be. But um, Bob Rydell and I had a wonderful time a couple of years ago looking at a Buffalo Bill poster called Vakana Dene of the Wild West. And it was Buffalo Bill riding a green frog. <laughs> and um, we explored all the implications of that poster, which was published in, in Italy in 1906. And we just had a great time. That's natural history, right? <laughs> See, everything connects. Uh, so so um, I've delved into that. I've delved into some firearms publications. I've written a little bit about some of our manuscript collections. So uh, I've, I've really had a lot of fun, just plain fun with these collections. They are delightful, and they never stop giving. Uh, and neither do the people that come here stop giving. It's just a wonderful, wonderful collaboration. Um, and uh, uh, the, the creativity of this staff um, is also just remarkable. Uh, again, my, my emphasis is more on our photographic collections, and I've been allowed to put together some exhibits. We've got two traveling right now. Uh, one is by a native photographer named Ken Blackbird, and his exhibit is at the Gilcrease in Tulsa, and then we have uh, a, an Edward Curtis exhibit traveling through Wyoming libraries. So I've gotten to try my hand at a lot of really fun, creative stuff with them here. It's been a terrific experience, and no negatives at all where <laughs> Buffalo Bill is concerned. That's not what you told me the other day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm inspired listening to everybody here. Um, you know, I said before that, that I was restless when I was in Denver Museum. Uh, I'm restless by nature as my wife, even though of 43 years, by the way, but uh, she'll tell you how restless I, I really am in, in a lot of ways. And, and so I was at university for uh, seven years and was tenured and had everything going for me and loved classroom teaching. I still miss day-to-day -day classroom teaching, which was theater to me, by the way. I enjoyed that part. <laughs> and, and, but, but I got restless. I went to the Denver Museum, loved that. I've been here 19 years now. Um, twice as, more than twice as long as I've been any other place. And it's because of these opportunities, really. Um, I mean, I can't get bored, I can't get restless here because there's always something new that I haven't e explored before. Um, so I still, I continue to do sort of what, what we call bench research, in, in a nat which is my field research in, in natural history and very, you know, classic, traditional ecological research. Um, but in addition to that, and not that I would become bored with that, I can't say that, my major professor would, would uh, disown me probably <laughs> if I did that, but this place is, and, and the people here have given me the opportunity to collaborate on so many different things that I, that I would never really thought of on my own. Jeremy and I uh, collaborated together on a, on a book, an award-winning book, as a matter of fact, um, on a revisitation of uh, Ernest uh, Thompson Seton's uh, WAB and, and really sort of looking at both the historical and natural historical uh, information provided in that and providing sort of an update on the forward and the afterward. That was great fun. Uh, Karen worked with us last year um, from an art perspective uh, on a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, I guess it was multidisciplinary, uh, exhibition on elk migration through the greater Yellowstone uh, ecosystem. Um, that was great fun and, and why I learned so much every time. The first exhibit that I worked on here was an exhibition on the wild or free-ranging horse in the western landscape and in that we incorporated um, I was a curator but boy I, I grabbed everybody I could on that and we we had a section on the lure of the wild horse and more the myth than the reality in that but the artwork was so critical in, in, in telling that story it's about storytelling and we got to the science of it but we went through where humans were a part of the story um, with uh, uh, Ashley and I are talking about now, and, and I don't know if it'll be part of the reinstallation or maybe more likely uh, an installation in the south entrance of, uh, somebody's going to fall out up there. Lynn, don't listen to this. Um, <laughs> our chief financial officer. Um, but uh, you know, on the possibility of really telling the, the robust story of hunter conservation uh, or hunting and conservation in uh, the American West primarily. Wonderful, rich story, and we haven't had that opportunity to really tell it a great deal. Um, uh, Rebecca mentioned that uh, this uh, um, exhibit on monarchic skies, it's a, uh, it's a golden eagle in greater Yellowstone in the American West, and it comes out of 
my research and the research of my colleagues throughout the West, but we have a long-term kind of 10-year project uh, now, so we'll be telling that science story and again, the, both the process and product of science. But we would be remiss, and in other institutions we probably wouldn't be able to do this, but we would be remiss if we didn't tell that story about the association, especially of native people and native cultures, plural, with not only the Golden Eagle, but wildlife in general, but the Golden Eagle provides a great vehicle uh, for doing something like this. And of course, Mary and I, in a sense, collaborate every day um, with the uh, new holdings in the library and looking at what we have and how we can expand that and bringing more folks in. So uh, while the, 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 the Draper is a um, uh, traditional museum in the sense, natural history museum in the sense that, that our core responsibilities are scientific research, collections development, uh, exhibits and outreach programming. We do it, I think, in a different way than a lot of traditional natural history museums. One quick story uh, to end my section here on something very specifically related to Buffalo Bill. And that's one of the, the many partnerships that we have that I'm most proud of. And that's a partnership with the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation. That came about in a lot of different ways, but Buffalo Bill was central to that. Um, as many of you probably know, uh, Prince Albert II's great-grandfather went on a famous hunting expedition. Great, great, I always get the great, great, because it doesn't seem that whole long ago, but it was great, 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 because he was pretty old at the time. Great, great grandfather um, went on a hunting, hunting expedition uh, along the North Fork and near Yellowstone um, in, in 1913. Um, the prince, Prince Albert II, uh, wanted to come here to commemorate that event. Um, and I know a lot of folks here were very excited about getting him interested in the Buffalo Bill Museum more and seeing that. But his interest at this stage, uh, it much like his great-great-grandfather, is environment and conservation across the glo globe. And he created this foundation now 11 years ago to do that. Well, after much talk and, and with the help of Tim White and lots of other folks that, uh, uh, that got involved here, we developed a relationship and a partnership to create what we call a Camp Monaco Prize to help support conservation research, uh, biodiversity conservation in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, but that has a twist to it. Again, it's taking it slightly out of the traditional academic or traditional museum sense. Um, we want each of these projects to have a human element uh, because humans are part of this system, not uh, are a part of, not a part from. Uh, and, and I think that's critical. Uh, with that. So that's a connection that would not have been possible without, uh, without William F. Cody uh, and his, uh, his relationship with the West and with people all over the globe. All right, thank you. As you can see, I work with a great bunch of colleagues here. And so on behalf of the Buffalo Bill Museum, I want to thank each and every one of you because, um, of course, our day-to-day -day tasks in the Buffalo Bill Museum are pretty much connected to Buffalo Bill. So, but I have to say, working with the five of you has been great because it has provided an additional dimension to Buffalo Bill through these interdisciplinary connections. And I do want to point out uh, two great exhibits, temporary exhibits that are located in the, the basement of the Buffalo Bill, or sorry, lower floor. <laughs> <laughs> lower floor of the Buffalo Bill. Special exhibition gallery. Special exhibition gallery in the lower floor. Um, but anyway, uh, there's a wonderful exhibit on our first director, Harold McCracken, in his uh, exhibition to Alaska. And then uh, Rebecca spearheaded a collaborative exhibit celebrating the 100 years of the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association. It was a lot of fun to work with these guys to select key treasures from each one of the museums. And you would think bringing all these different objects together would be kind of chaotic and wouldn't tell much of a narrative, but I think uh, it's really, when you look at all this as a whole, it's really quite amazing how much of an interrelationship there is between all of these museums. And of course, um, a lot of us are indebted to Mary. Many of you sitting in this room are indebted to Mary and her staff, and I want to point out Carling Ember Newfie, who's back here. The human index is what I refer to her, because she's helped so much with uh, research for various projects here. You'll, you'll do some contract work, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so with that, I want to open it up to questions from the audience. So, and, and again, if you can use the microphone, Jeff, your hand went up. 
Brianna down here. Right here. Oh, what happened to our other mic? Yeah, my question is, uh, it was triggered by Patty's talk uh, at lunch when she had that graph up there for the, uh, and she said this is across the United States and as I was studying that graph while it was up there, um, they have a hundred majors consistently that are history majors at CU every year but the enrollment has dropped from uh, like 15 years ago, for every history major, there was five non-history majors taking history classes. And now it's down to two. So it's dropping. dropping dramatically. In the organizations that I belong to, there's been a conversation for a number of years called the grain of the organization. Some of you may have heard that. We hear the comments from people today who are here because of their grandfathers or uh, stories of their family and that sort of thing and hearing about the Wild West show and having the interest and we had Hollywood behind us so it got so many of us into, I, I think you said it yourself, that uh, no, it was, it was Paul Hutton about da Davy Crockett and that, that, that draws people into history. And this museum is a wonderful place to draw people into history especially with its, its various uh, uh, units and that. But my question is, is have you seen a, a drop in interest in this that, that would match what Patty's seen and what I've seen? And, and, and if so, do you have an idea as to how we might generate that back? Good question. I'll just mention one disconcerting um, instance. This is two years ago, a scholar who I admire greatly, Joni Kenzie, who is a historian of much of Western American art, but sp specifically into Yellowstone's art and art history. She had a class um, that didn't make, that they didn't, they didn't end up hosting because there weren't enough students interested. And I just could not imagine how that could happen. But it is, I mean, I, I see it clearly um, at universities across the United States. I think people are worried about you know, job opportunities um, and are looking beyond the liberal arts for something that really, you know, would offer a stable career, even though for some it can offer a stable career. Um, but it is, it's disconcerting, but I think we have an opportunity here to engage new and different audiences. And because of our proximity to Yellowstone, we get quite a wide swath of the population, both nationally and internationally here. And so it's our opportunity to kind of capture and you know, plant the seed of imagination and interest um, in the spirit of the American West. Well, and for firearms and history, there aren't really any programs in, in the country where you can study both, um, unless it's a military history, but that's only a, one portion of the firearm story, so I guess it can only go <laughs> up from there. But um, one of the things that we have the opportunity here, and we had a symposium last month that was the first ever of its kind to unite firearms museum professionals and firearms historians from around the world, uh, because we have an ability to legitimize ourselves in the academic community so that we can encourage people to study firearms um, in many different respects in the historical field. And one way that we found, at least for engaging, Millennial, uh, <laughs> millennial, my assistant back there. Uh, we use we engage people on the internet, and we've been using um, Facebook Live to encourage people to know that you can study firearms and that and history can be fun. And it's a very informal platform, but there's a lot that we can do on site with programming. But we found that our engagement rates are incredibly high to get people excited about firearms history and museums just through Facebook Live because they don't realize that. It can be fun. And then the, the other side of that is the legitimization of our field in the academic community so that when people do get excited about it and they watch videos and they laugh and they you know, realize things about history that they didn't know were true or things they thought that were true that were not, they have a place that they can now go. And so we're trying to kind of two-prong, get people stoked, and then have the, the community for them to really start to embrace that academic level of study in our discipline. So ours is a little bit different because we don't have the engagement right now. Do I have time, or would you like to go on to the next question? No, um, we're at 5.43. Okay, <laughs> let's do another question, and we'll just keep moving. Uh, Chuck that? wanted to. Okay. Um, yeah, just r real quickly, um, I'll be the Harris heretic here uh, on that, um, where history enrollment has gone down in many areas, and in fact, 
visitation at history museums and art museums and others have gone down in some areas. Natural Science Museum, Natural Science Curricula, especially in conservation biology, has skyrocketed. I get more offers now every month um, from universities looking to add a senior uh, faculty member um, but to, to try to, to cover some of these topics. And by definition, conservation biology specifically, where I've morphed from an ecologist more to a conservation biologist, is a, is a um, is integrated with um, with other disciplines, with especially social science and economics and others. Look at that. So I'm looking at the issue a little differently here, and I, and I see what you're seeing. We've seen it in, in attendance here, not as it's dropped over the years a bit, picking up a little bit this year. M my argument to, of course, anybody to listen here is, guys, we have m the increase in visitation to Yellowstone every year increasing, more than four million last year. You can argue with the specific numbers, but ca you can't argue with the relative index to abundance on those, the trend. Um, and they are focused on nature and science. They're not focused, as you pointed out, anymore because we don't have Paladin, my favorite, by the way, was I've gotten one travel. We don't have that or the movies, and so they're not getting that. I've argued that both to increase our visitation, but also to increase, as these folks have said in some ways, increase people's uh, association and, and visibility, increase the visibility of history and these other disciplines we recognize here. Um, we need to reach out very specifically to what is. You don't try to convince people to, to come see what you want or buy your product. You find out what they're interested in and tell them, you've got that, now come see us. When you do that, then you open the world up. So I think, uh, and again, that's the heresy part. I know that's not what historians would love to hear, and it may not be right. But my sense is if we can get them in the door with some of the things that are very popular now, that we have the opportunity to grab them then and, mm -hmm. and visibility. Yeah. And I would just add, I think, as historians, we've kind of lost sight of relevancy. And I think we really need to make history relevant. And I think the interdisciplinary work we do here together really does a great job of demonstrating the relevancy of history. Yes, we uh, have Tom, and then we'll go up to Chris. Um, I, I would like to just react to something Jeremy said. I think the most significant statement was Jeremy has expressed concerns a couple of times about proposals that uh, we should take the Buffalo Bill. So some people want the Buffalo Bill taken out of this. Now, anyone who really understands the West realizes this is a huge sub subject. You need to have a defining factor. Um, you've, you've always got this wonderful interdisciplinary range of skills. Uh, and without that defining factor, the whole thing just becomes amorphous and falls apart. You take Buffalo Bill out of this, you take the soul out of this wonderful institution. Uh, and I want to point out that was discussed in the past, Tom. Yeah, well, I'm glad so the decision was made to keep Buffalo Bill. So, well, that's that's one piece of history I hope stays okay. history. <laughs> Did you hear that, <laughs> uh, Chris? If you pass, oh. I'd like to make a very brief comment in praise of so much that goes on here, um, and then I've got a question. So if you will bear with me just for a very, very brief comment, because uh, all of the curators coming from very different disciplines um, have spoken about interdisciplinarity and the way in which they work together. But I would want, and you can probably tell from my accent that I'm not a local, I would want to emphasize the international dimension and some of the collaborations that have been made possible um, over the course of the last 15 years in particular. Um, there have been collaborations that have resulted in Dr. Johnston becoming Dr. Johnston from a Scottish institution <laughs> where I had the privilege once of teaching. Um, there have been collaborations um, uh, across in various other parts of Europe and with other areas beyond uh, any of the areas that we've touched upon yet today. There was a very significant and there is an ongoing project to do with Scots in the American West that has uh, involved a number of people uh, in this room and beyond this room. And um, I couldn't help but embarrass Carling in saying how much she really 
really contributed to a lot of those things in her own quiet and very efficient way. So having said those words of praise, which I mean from the heart, um, I've got a very specific question for Rebecca. Um, because Rebecca, um, uh, you mentioned the major reinstallation uh, of the Plains Indian Museum, which um, I, my first visit here was just to the old museum. Um, I came here quite regularly um, after the reinstallation. I had the privilege of going round the Plains Indian Museum just after the reinstallation uh, with the late, great Curly Bear Wagner, um, who was able to give me his perspectives on his involvement in that reinstallation. But I do think in your initial remarks, um, this idea that there are many Indian people across this country for whom the term museum is a barrier rather than the, the term Buffalo Bill, I think that really, um, that's something that's crucially important. I'm sure you agree. And I'm just wondering, given that we are now almost 20 years beyond the reinstallation, are there any thoughts about when the next reinstallation of the Plains Indian Museum uh, might be? And factoring into that, are there any thoughts about how an approach to that can help overcome that, for very good reasons, embedded cultural negativity about the relationship between museum and museum cultures, in inverted commas, and the cultures of American Indian people? Well, I'll have to be honest, we have not specifically discussed a major reinstallation for the Plains Indian Museum because although it is almost 20 years old, right now we're in what I would call the, uh, the maintenance and, and updating phase because we have a wonderful museum. Uh, we know that 17 years is a long time in a museum's life and we have the day-to-day -day just logistics that things start breaking down. Um, but these are opportunities too, because while we're not planning a major reinstallation, we are looking very carefully at everything from AV elements uh, to computers to different object presentations. And we know what's worked well, but there's been this sudden realization that we cannot sit on what's been done already. And those existing AV elements and computers <coughs> and things like that have to go global. And when they go global, you not only gain a mass understanding and you reach broader audiences, but you also provide a greater accessibility to Native people. Um, and one of the, the nice things that's happened, and this is certainly not related to um, the reinstallation, but it's really related to museum policy and museum attitudes, and a lot of you don't hear about this, but our museum policies and museum attitudes have changed incredibly over the last even 20 years. We were good before, but we're really good now. We have a, a support staff of maintenance and administration that realizes that we have to be flexible and respectful and ready to accommodate persons that come in. If they wanna come into the vaults and cedar off or smudge, we're able to accommodate them. We're not as concerned about certain basic museum rules and the way things were done before as we are with extending those relationships. Um, we are looking more specifically, however, at some really exciting programs. Hunter Old Elk is here in the audience, just to your right, and she's the curatorial assistant for the Plains Indian Museum, started in February. And Hunter and I are working on a great idea that she spearheaded, which is a tribal college symposium. And if there's one way that you want to take care of many of these questions that we just had, which is uh, if you think there's a lack of enrollment in some of the history programs, you should look at the statistics for um, native students in these areas. There, it's, there's a real um, absence in that area. So we'd like to reach out from the ground up and have a connection with tribal colleges to really start this movement. So it's one of many programs, and I promise that um, it's always in the back of our mind for reinstallation, but we do have a few more of those ahead of us, I think, that we need to get through first. <laughs> I'm looking at Lynn. <laughs> Lynn just passed out when she heard second <laughs> reinstallation. So, but Lee's right beside you. He'll get the money for you, Lynn. Don't worry about it. One more question from Patty. So relevance can be 
really difficult and really painful if you pull it off. I was involved a little bit at the West of West's America exhibit. I spoke at the opening exhibit and went back to defend them when the controversy started. So relevance is quite a uh, heated experience and involves a lot of adrenaline and also is worth doing. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering on how you're navigating the relevance thing because, I mean, I did say today, I think Buffalo Bill would be incredibly useful for rural-urban divide, for truth, for anti-government attitudes. Would I ask friends to take that? <laughs> it doesn't seem fair <laughs> to ask that of friends. Uh, also, and sorry to say this, but uh, humanities people may or may not be great when it comes to dealing with controversy, but scientists are often worse. <laughs> so that one great reason to have uh, partnerships between the sciences and the humanities is that the scientists on their own are just, oh, they're lambs to the slaughter sometimes. It's very sad, but sorry. Unsheared lambs just going out there <laughs> into the blizzard. So anyway, so I just think that the question of relevance, obviously applied history, I think that's the whole, that's the game, but strategies for dealing with controversy, uh, West is America 26 years ago, but still haunts people for what can happen when you get relevance and you get response. So just strategies about how to, and good heavens firearms, good mm -hmm. heavens so firearms. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So that's a really calm subject. That's so yeah. totally calm. So I just I think you were just very well poised for being mega relevant, but whether you want that or not, given the yeah. troubles, but certainly the scientists can benefit from that collaboration. ESA, how I mean, you're doing the Fantastic. ecosystem habitat, how and there's campaigns always to get rid of the Endangered Species Act. So, so maybe my pitch is just have other dreams besides relevance, because it is really a. a heated, it and, it and maybe is. that's good, maybe that's attractive, but I just would like to hear a little bit about how you yeah. all respond to that. I, I just respond real quickly and reinforce what you said about scientists being in general uh, uh, very poor at dealing with handling controversy. Um, one of the things that, that uh, my wife and I now have been asked to do, and we're starting to travel the country a little bit more, we did this in the southeast 30 years ago. My wife is a journalist, um, and so she used to come home to me and say, you scientists don't know how to talk to people. <laughs> what is up with this? And she has drilled me over the years. One of the reasons that I left academia to go to the Denver Museum was because of the public ed education aspect of it. And not that, that I've got it all right or that we are getting better. <laughs> Sometimes I think we're, we're digressing. But one of the things that I'm excited about is teaching this, this course with my wife and I together um, on communicating science to the public and in uh, in dealing with some of the hot controversies of the day and understanding the hot buttons and the words, the vocabulary is so critical. But you're right, and yeah, I rely on these guys a lot to help me with this. You gonna go ahead? Yes, and okay. then I'll jump in there. Okay, um, so firearms, obviously, uh, in today's society can be a hot button topic, and it's kind of interesting to watch. There's, there was a symposium, I believe it was in Germany, called Does War Belong in Museums? And the answer was yes. But it was that discussion of how do you talk about you know, violence? How do you talk about uncomfortable topics? And it was that vacillation between sterilization and glamorization. And historically, gun museums and, and gun collections have been by the collector for the collector, which if you know about guns, you can walk in and go, OK, I make connections of this gun with this part of history. And you can do all that. And I can do that, but I always do this. Sorry, mom. I always do this. But my mom is not, you know, didn't grow up around guns. And when she walks into our firearms museum, her takeaway is, wow, you have a lot of guns. <laughs> 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 and so one of the things that we're trying to do in the new museum is answer the why question, contextualize for people. And I think that it, a lot of times gun museums sterilize certain things because they don't know how to have the conversation. And so what we're trying to do is that balance. So. My, I always say my job is not to make you walk into the museum, come out, and want to buy a gun and learn how to shoot and learn all about gun safety. I mean, if you want to do that, great. I'm an NRA certified firearms instructor, and I'd be happy to help you with that. But my point is that it gives you the tools to draw your own conclusions about what you think about firearms. I want you to draw conclusions from a more informed rather than necessarily emotional base. And so what we're working on, and I always say, is, is integrate it integrate difficult conversations when relevant, but don't segregate it. Because I think it gets difficult if you do an exhibit specifically on you know, firearms and violence. It makes it difficult for you to associate other things with firearms when you do that. And so we've got this timeline in the new museum. And it's 
everything that's ever happened in, in Firearms history, from like 300 BCE all the way up through modern day. And what we're trying to do is pull in relevant things in history when you know gun legislation's passed and how that affects it, when wars happen and how that affects culture and how you know companies that had nothing to do with guns made guns during wartime. And we're starting to integrate some of those contextual ideas into the museum so people can start going, oh, I get how this happened here and why it happened and what the bigger narrative is of it. Um, I don't have all the answers right now. It's part of the reason we had a little bit of our symposium was to talk about how we talk about it because it hasn't been done in the past. And so we're trying to find a good way for people to be able to see, yes, there is a violent component to firearms history, but it's not the entire story. And when you contextualize it for people, they can start to make the conclusion and, and figure out what they want to know about firearms and what they want to think about firearms moving forward. Yeah, and what I would add to that, it is difficult. Um, like Chuck, I, I made the transition from academia into public history. And I taught at Northwest College for 15 some years. My favorite class was History of Wyoming um, because uh, I grew up in Wyoming, so my family goes way back here. So in many ways, it was a study not just of the state's past, but some of the my past. And I could really see how the past shaped Wyoming today. The classroom is a great laboratory. You have a captured audience there. You can throw all sorts of ideas. You can test them. You can question them. You can create all sorts of debates amongst the people sitting in the classroom. Public history, it's, it's been a challenge for me because <laughs> the word that's bandied about here is edutainment. We have people that come through the front door Yes, they want to see the objects, they want to, to learn about the West, but they also want to be entertained. They want to have an exciting, engaging experience. And when you have to boil down an argument and try and make history relevant in a panel where they tell you no more than 100 words and keep it at an eighth grade lead reading level, it's, it's challenging, it's challenging. So, but I, I do think there's an opportunity for us to introduce some of these themes, collaborate with academia, where in the classroom you can then take these to the next level. Because if we don't do it, I tell you who is going to do it, and this is a good lesson to take home from Buffalo Bill's Wild West. The popular media will do it. Entertainment will do it. Kids will learn more about history through film if we don't step up and do something. Six oh one. That's the first time we've ever ended on time. We're somewhat on time. So I want to thank all of you for attending today's session.